Good evening. Welcome once again to The Bible Speaks today from LBC Television Ministries here in Latonia, which they tell me is pouring with rain outside. Um, by now, if you've been following this, you've seen the first two programs in, in this series we're calling The Cities of the Bible, um, and currently we're dealing with Jerusalem. And uh, to whet your appetite a little bit, when we finish with Jerusalem, in a, in a few weeks, whenever it is, however long it takes us, uh, we're going to go on to Jericho. So those of you who like uh, um, some real deep history, then, then you might want to stay with us. One thing I should make clear on, on this series of programs anyway, and most of my programs anyway, is that we're putting together all the information, both from the secular sources and from the biblical sources, putting it together and comparing it. And quite often, quite often, the, the historical sources, those that we have, don't tie nicely in with the biblical story. And I need to make it clear that, at least as far as I'm concerned anyway, that the Bible, whilst it gives us a lot of history, is not a history book. It's a faith book. And the Israelites, whilst they were writing it, whoever put all the various people who put it together, you know, we've done this, who wrote the Bible program a couple of times, you know, whoever it was, Jeremiah or, or, or you know, Nehemiah or whoever. One of the things that they did, they weren't writing it as a general history for everybody else, but as, a, as a, an account of themselves, who we are, who the Israelites are. And so they tend, obviously, to, to enhance the deeds of the Israelites and downplay the deeds of everybody else. And you'll find that happening quite a lot. And then as it's been amended through, the, through its early days, before, before um, I guess, before BC 01 or one zero, whatever. Um, it people added their own comments and commentaries in there, and you can see that popping up as we'll see in a moment when we get into the program proper. If you remember last week, we we kind of finished off with David um, establishing Jerusalem as the the center or the chief city of the Israelites. Uh, and I mentioned the fact that it wasn't at that time a tribal city, a tribal headquarters. David, in fact, uh, and his tribe, Judah, lived at Hebron. Um, but by taking Jerusalem, they, they kind of got a place that wasn't sort of anybody's, or everybody's, if you like. And that's where Jerusalem became, where it first became the, the, the center of, of, of religion. Okay. And in according to the books of Samuel, David uh, made an altar uh, at a place he bought from, from a gentleman. And uh, it was a threshing floor, you know, where you beat out um, the grain, so it would have been fairly sizable. And David built an altar there. Um, a lot, not a lot, a considerable number of Bible scholars look at this story of the altar as a as, an, as by the narrator or whoever's writing it at the time, to give an Israelite foundation to a pre-existing sanctuary. So in other words, there was always something there. Um, may, may have been, may not have been. But anyway, it's the first written account biblically of where the first altar in Jerusalem came. And of course, later on, according to the biblical narrative anyway, Solomon built a more substantive temple, which we know as the Temple of Solomon, at, at a location which, according to the book of Chronicles, equals David's altar. So it became a sort of continuous, we had an altar and then we made it into a temple and it's been a long line. And I mentioned that the temple became a major cultural center in the region, not just a place of worship, a place of culture. In other words, people came to admire the architecture and the beauty of it and this sort of thing. And, and we could do three or four programs just on on what the temple was like from what descriptions we have of it. But it, came, it, it, it became the main place of, of worship for the Israelites uh, at the expense of, of some other places which formerly were kind of um, a big do for them, you know, a big uh, more ritual centers like Shiloh and, and Bethel and one or two others. And so there was already, if you get it, if they say, okay, forget about you guys anymore, forget about selling trinkets to tourists and, and, and sacrifices to the people. 
people, we're going to do it all at Jerusalem. So there were already some mutterings in the background from people who, who felt they were being pushed aside. Solomon also uh, is described as, as, um, as, as building several other important, really important building works in Jerusalem, um, including the construction of his palace, of course, which was, which was quite good. And archaeologists, as always, you get two archaeologists in a room, you've got an argument. Right, you've got three, you've got all sorts of things. But they're divided over, over whether the biblical narrative of these great buildings is supported by the evidence from excavations. <coughs> now, if you follow biblical or, or, or Christian archaeology or even just regular archaeology news, you'll know that over the years they've been digging to try and find the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem for years and they're still not sure whether they found it or not. Because, for example, one archaeologist says that the digging that she's done uncovers the remains of large stone buildings, big large buildings, like a temple or a palace and that sort of thing, for the correct time period. And yet, and yet another of her, her, of her uh, associates in the same country from Israel dispute both that interpretation and say no they're not big stone buildings and also the dating the dating of the finds is supposed to be when the kingdom of Judah split from the larger kingdom of Israel okay we all remember that it's in the Bible right which the Bible places at the end of Solomon's reign about 930 BC okay though again a lot of the archaeologists actually dispute whether the fact that the kingdom existed as a unified group to begin with. The, the, I guess the, 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 uh, the argument is that when David made Jerusalem the central point of worship, the, uh, the um, people to the north got really upset because it took away their power and prestige. And, and in fact, it, pro it may not have been a divided kingdom. He was nominally king, but... The people up the north did their own thing. I don't know. We only have the biblical um, uh, narrative to, to guide us. The problem is that Israel in those days wasn't that big a deal. It was Solomon made it a big uh, trading center. People were coming all the way through it and became very powerful. But as far as the history of Israel, nobody really cared. They were just passing through. So we don't have too much about it. But anyway, with the split... Jerusalem became the capital of Judah, while the kingdom of, of Israel located its uh, uh, capital, if you will, at Shechem in, in Samaria, which is, not, you know, we all know Good Samaritan story, remember that? Samaria is the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, there's a couple of archaeologists and, 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 and uh, scholars that I read. Uh, one of them is called Thompson, T. Thompson. He, his suggestion is that it only really became a city and capable as acting as a state capital, in other words, big with important buildings and that, in the middle of the 7th century, 700 years BC. A lot later than the 930 period, so we don't know. But both the Bible and, and, uh, and um, regional, what's the word, um, archaeology, Tend to tend to agree that uh, um, now I've lost my page. Um, tend to agree that the uh, the temple and the big and the big buildings existed, but that the uh, the um, political situation you know, at the time was was so uh, uh, make, so fluid that you can't be really really sure. What happened? Okay. Uh, let me get to where I was. That's right. You should always remember your script. Anyway, what happened was the the uh, the, the, the kingdom split. Okay, and then we got this awkward situation where the whole area was politically unstable from about nine twenty five to to about seven hundred and something. Um, it was. Conquered, unconquered, you know, up and down like a yo-yo. Very difficult to find any kind of, um, what's the word, uh, uh, established 
chronology. I mean, in, in, in 925, let's take 925, uh, the whole region was invaded by the Egyptian pharaoh, I get this, Shi Shonk I, right? Which is of the, if you're following pharaohs of the third intermediate period, I, I get confused who they are. But he's possibly Shishak, who's mentioned in the Bible who captured and pillaged Jerusalem. So that's how we tie it together. You know, we, we've got an uh, Egyptian record of the pharaoh called Shishonk, who, you know, captured Israel. The Bible calls him Shishank, Shishank, and, and, but it's at the same period, so probably the same guy, okay? About, about 75 years later, the, uh, Jerusalem's army and, and that were involved in an in a indecisive battle against uh, Shalomisa III from, from uh, Syria at the Battle of Karga, which is you know, historically accounted. According to the Bible, Jehoshaphat of Judah was allied to Ahab, which was that king of Judah, was allied to Abraham in the northern kingdom of Israel at the time. Okay? So they were together, different countries, but fighting against the, the, the Syrians. And the Bible records that, that shortly after this, Jerusalem was sacked again, okay, by the Philistines and the Arabs and the Ethiopians, I guess they all joined together, who looted King Jehoram, okay, and carried off all his family, usual thing, remember what I said last time, you know, take, take the royal family with you and keep them in exile, that way they can't store up any rebellion. But they missed somebody called Jehoaz. Jehoaz, sorry. Okay, two decades, 20 years later, most of Canaan, including Jerusalem, now you notice that some scholars are still calling it Canaan, the land of Canaan, but not the land of Israelites, was conquered by has real of Aram Damascus, so so they come the Syrians again, okay, and uh, again according to the Bible, Jehoash of Judah, remember the story, he gives all of his Jerusalem's treasures as as a tribute, as a bribe. But I guess Haziel proceeded to destroy all the princes of the people in the city. So I guess he wasn't satisfied with the bribe; he he destroyed all the the royal family again. Fifty years later. Jehoahash of Israel sacked Jerusalem. That's the northern kingdom. So you can see they're, they're up and down like a, like a bunch of yo-yos, okay? Uh, I've got a whole horde of notes here. I'm trying to pick out the ones. That, uh, half a century after that, the city was sacked by Jehoash, as I said, and, and he destroyed the walls. Now, the big thing about, you've got to understand about this. In those days, up until past medieval times, a city without walls was indefensible. If you didn't have walls, you couldn't keep, couldn't keep anybody out. So the first thing you do is knock the walls down. Then, right, we, you got that. And he took Amaziah of Judah prisoner. So by the end of what they call the first temple period, G Jerusalem was the sole acting religious shrine in the kingdom and a central regular peerage, despite the fact that about every 50 years it got sacked or ransacked or bothered. And, and most archaeologists will agree, and I had to go dig deep for this, that that's um, supported by the evidence, by the, by the archaeology evidence backs up the biblical evidence that Jerusalem was the centre of, of, of this attraction. Except that they still keep finding this personal cult in, in, invol involving the Asherith figures, you know, the little goddess Asherith, which, which uh, was spread throughout the outlying land. So it looks like they kept the, uh, um, they, they worshipped the one god sort of thing, but kept the other, the old pagan gods in the background just in case, I suppose. Okay, well then, now we move into what the, the historians call the, the Assyrian and Babylonian Empire period, okay? And the siege of Jerusalem in 597, and the reason I make these dates up, you can see how things jump along in, in order, led to the Babylonians you know, overcoming the city, who, took, who then took King Jehoiakim, remember? We've had all these different kings from the Bible. Now we see them here in, in, in historical context, into Babylonian captivity, together again with most of the aristocracies. Zedekiah, who'd been placed on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar, I mentioned this last week briefly, rebelled, and Nebuchadnezzar, who was the big ruler of the time, 
We came back, recaptured the city, killed all his family in front of him and, and punched out his eyes so that that would be the last thing he ever saw. And then they took him into captivity along with all the prominent members of Judah and then they burnt the temple, destroyed the city walls and, and appointed Gedaliah as the, as the uh, governor of Judah. And that's all in the Bible as well as in some secular outside things. Uh, but two months later, Yishmael, son of Netaniah, all these names popping out of the Bible, right? who was a survivor of Zedekiah, assassinated the governor and, and some of the remaining population of Judah, fearing vengeance of Nebuchadnezzar, obviously because he fled to Egypt. So the, the, the country was, was desolate, okay? Nobody living there, uh, well, just a few. I mean, if, you, if you're not a farmer and the land is all you've got, if you're a city dweller, a tradesman or an artisan or something, uh, then the easiest thing when things get bad is to pack up and go somewhere else. And a lot of the Israelites, besides the ones who went to Babylon, went to Egypt. So we've got two centers of Judaism building up, Babylon and, and Egypt. According to the Bible, and then again, as I said last week, perhaps corroborated by the Cyrus uh, uh, writings, after several decades of captivity, the Bible says 50 years, uh, and, and um, the Archimedes, in other words the Persians, conquered Babylon, Cyrus II of Persia allows the Jews to come back to Judah and rebuild the temple. And that's where the books of, of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah record the re construction of the second temple. Okay, uh, and again, the, those two books record that it was finished in 516 BC. Following which, Artaxerxes sends Ezra and then Nehemiah to rebuild the city walls because, as I said, you can build the temple up, great, you've got the worship thing, that, but you're still indefensible. Still, all the people around Jerusalem are, we call them Samaritans, but they're the people, the Jews who were left behind after all, it was Jerusalem that was conquered, so the leading aristocracy from that city went, but the remains of the people in the northern kingdom and the outlying parts of, of uh, Judah would have been left behind. So they're still up there, probably fermenting revolts. So you've got to remember that after that point in time, nothing much, I mean, a lot of things happened, but Jerusalem was the capital of the kingdom of Judah for some 400 years. That in 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 antiquity that is a long time it, it, it survived a, a siege in 701 by a Sennacherib again we're getting that from the Bible it uh, unlike Samaria the northern capital that went under about 20 years previously so according to the Bible now the reason Jerusalem survived according to the Bible, was that there was a miraculous event in which an angel killed 185,000 men in Sennacherib's army. It's a lot of guys. However, if you read Sennacherib's own account, which is preserved in one of those temple writings, um, an inscription contemporary with the event, the king of Judah, Hezekiah, was shut up like a caged bird. Eventually, he persuaded Sennacherib to leave by giving him a whole bunch of money. Okay? So, you can see that... Uh, the biblical account doesn't always tie in with the, with the secular account. Either way, Jerusalem survived. When Alexander the Great conquered the Persian kingdom, remember Cyrus and Darius, they were Persian. When Alexander the Great conquered the Persianism, Jerusalem and Judah fell under Greek control and the Hellenic influence. Okay, Now the Greek, great civilization, writing, literature, philosophy, everything. So it's a big influence, okay? And, and after the wars that followed Alexander's death, Jerusalem and Judah fell under the Ptolemies, under the control of the Ptolemies, under Ptolemy I, and continued, would you believe, were allowed to continue minting Yehud coinage. Yehud was a Jewish name for their coinage. In other words, most countries, once they're captured or taken over, they make, them make the money of, of whoever wins. In this case, they allowed them to print their own coinage, and we have examples of them. Now, getting closer down, in 198 BC, as a, as, a, as a result of the Battle of Paneum, Ptolemy V, so we've gone through 
one, two, three, four, five Ptolemies, still in control, lost Jerusalem and Judah to the Seleucids under Antiochus the Great. Okay? Under the Seleucids, uh, who are very Greek oriented, many Jews became Hellenized. You know, they took up Jewish customs and Jewish dress and Jewish pastimes and this sort of thing. And, and, and the Seleucids, thinking that they had a lot of support from those Jews, tried to, to Hellenize Jerusalem, turn it into an, a, to a, a Greek city, which obviously, <laughs> as usual with these things, culminated in a rebellion led by Matizayu, okay, the high priest and his five sons. Now, I mention their names because they pop up in the Apocrypha. Remember we talked about the Apocrypha? Simon, Joachim, Eliza, Jonathan, and Judah the Maccabee. Maccabee, sounds familiar to you? Okay. And as a result of the rebellion, the Seleucids were kicked out, and Jerusalem became the capital of the Hashmanian kingdom. Kind of interesting there, because the current king of Jordan is in fact, fact a Hashmanian descendant. King, it's one of those little things you know about. That meant that the Jews were ruling themselves. They were a theocracy. In other words, they were under a, a religious, you know, the king governed, but the, the religion priest, high priest, told him what to do, okay? It lasted for 103 years. So this was a high point in Judaism at some point. They had their own kingdom back to the time of Solomon. And that was what, 600 years, 700 years ago? Okay? It was ruled by Simon, the son of Mattis Yahu. Then by Joachim, who, who started minting coins again. Then by his son. And then, strangely enough, by his wife, Salome Alexandra. I could not find a great deal of information about her. Not that, you know, other than obscure references and, and theories. Then by his brother Yanni. Then by his sons, Hyrcanus and Astorbulus. When the brothers, Hyrcanus and Astorbulus, Aristobulus asked Rome to intervene on their behalf in, in the problems they were having with other people. Judah fell under the great rule of Rome. In other words, Rome said, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll help. We'll take over, you know. And so they were an autonomous prospect, but still a significant amount of independence. And, and this all affects Jerusalem because it's still thriving as a center of, of uh, Religious worship, which means you bring in tourists and bring in religious people. So people still flock to the temple on different festivals. So Jerusalem's a big thing. And whoever controls Jerusalem basically controls the rest of it. Okay? But it still had a lot of independence. In fact, the last Hashmonean king was Ast Ast Aristobulus' son, Mart Martisyahu and Antigonus. Okay? But then up comes... Herod the Great in 37. See how much close we're coming to times that you recognize from your New Testament studies? Herod the Great captures Jerusalem, ends the Hashmonean rule, okay? And Herod, now notice this, the Romans didn't stop Herod. Although it was a client state under the Hashmoneans, when Herod moved in, they didn't stop him. They just let him carry on and conquer it. But he ruled the province as a client king of the Romans. Okay? So, Herod actually did a lot of, from the secular point of view, did a lot of good things. He rebuilt, again, the second temple. So really it was the third temple, although they don't refer it to that. He upgraded the whole thing. Um, he expanded coins, minting coins in all different denominations. You know, real big... Um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, social effort, you know, buildings and places of worship and, and bigger, better roads and water. I mean, the third, Herod's temple, which is really, uh, I'm sorry, everyone says second temple period, but it's third temple because he rebuilt the second temple with Nehemiah and Ezra and, 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 and really got it to where it was something really wonderful. Um, Pliny the Elder, who's a Roman historian, if you've, ever done any Roman history, he pops up all over the place. He writes, talking about Herod's achievements, okay? Now, we're only 37 years before Christ, okay? He says, Jerusalem is the famous, most famous city by far 
of the of the eastern cities and not only the cities of Judah but but other cities around so it must have been pretty sharp and and, and the Talmud which is the the commentary on the Torah in the Jewish faith uh, comments that if you've not seen the temple of Herod you've never seen a beautiful building in your life so at this point in time Jerusalem Tacitus says Jerusalem is the is the capital of the Jews a temple possessing possessing enormous riches so at this point in time although they're a client state although Herod's does some pretty nasty things all the way along from the outside point of view Jerusalem is a very modern city with with modern buildings uh, modern thoroughfares you know a great place to go and visit wonderful architecture probably art museums you know this sort of thing so you have to remember that the time Christ was born Jerusalem was the you know the shining star in that particular area and we'll leave it there because I've got to come back and pick that up next week and not repeat myself as I've been doing this week a little bit um, and when we do we'll see what happens in those early what we call the, the Jesus Christ's lifetime period okay get your bible out ready for next week and we'll, you'll probably need it to remix some references until then good night and god bless <laughs>